Hi! Hello, everybody! Welcome to D&D Time Talks, the show where we discuss all things Dungeons and Dragons. I'm Pete. I'm Jeremy. And this is D&D Time that Talks. Thanks for watching, Pete. everyone. Yeah, that's it. Uh, no. How are you doing today, Pete? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I'm doing doing pretty good. Uh, it's been a pleasant day. Uh, I don't have to work tomorrow, which is really nice. So I can just stay here and talk about Dungeons and Dragons for up to a whole hour. Up to an entire hour. It's yeah. interesting. I see, I see Chad's talking about our new background. Yeah, guys, I just put some monsters we're going to talk about on here. Yep. <laughs> that's, I that's... also like it because the art in 5th edition is very good. It's uh, like... It's part of the reason why I like 5th edition, I feel like, so much is oh, yeah. suddenly, Absolutely. like, I don't realize it myself, but the thing that has hooked me has probably been the art. And when I say I don't realize it, I guess that makes no sense, because I'm saying it right now. But I guess I just realized it. Yeah, I mean, that that's the first thing that grabs anyone. Yeah. But yeah, we're going to be talking about monster tactics today. I'm really excited about this topic. It's pretty cool. There's a lot to talk about, so we're going to take a kind of broad kind of spread at it uh, and you're going to be talking about general monster like types so like i mean without spoiling too much like the ambusher kind of monster and how to roll that kind of stuff but yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be really cool i think monster tactics pete and you know i mean you probably feel the same way i feel like it's criminally criminally underdone for uh, um underdone. In, most, in most games uh, but I think, uh, as much as it's underdone, I think that's for good reason, because it's kind of hard, and if you don't really, like, yeah, think but... about what your tactics are going to be in ahead of time, then it's really easy to just forget to even do them, because you're so focused on everything else. So yeah. I think it's a great idea, and I think we'll talk about this a bit, like, you really got to look at the stat blocks and think in advance, like, what are these monsters made to do? Because sometimes it's not necessarily clear just with one read. Ah, I see. I see, V-Bunny. Let's talk about monsterceptions. When you put a monster in a monster and a monster wearing a monster like a flesh golem wearing an animated armor, oh my god, I can't keep going with that. Uh, we're not going to quite be talking about that level of strategy. Um, an animated cape. Uh. <laughs> A.K.A. Roper. Holy shit, you got some brutal capes, bud. Uh, uh, their cloak is actually a cloaker. Um, uh, yeah, that would make some terrifying sense huh yeah that would be but yeah the worst we're thing. we talking about a bunch of stuff it's gonna be cool um so hello uh also i don't know if we said hello to chat did we say hello to oh, chat chat i love you hello chat <laughs> I, I also love you uh and chat if you uh have any questions comments concerns ask us and we'll be looking at chat as we go through and also don't forget if you have questions <laughs> for me and jeremy just in general you can post them oh, no. on the D and D time Discord. Uh, <laughs> oh no, the cloaker cloak fury! Oh dear God! Yeah, uh, the <laughs> Jesus. Uh, you can look at them in Discord. <laughs> post us questions in the Ask Pete and Jeremy's category. We'll answer them at the end of stream. You know the deal, probably at this point. Um, oh, Maddie Morgs, I see you're in the chat. I got your delivery. Oh, they're beautiful, beautiful. And hello, Diadems, and hello, everyone else, too. This is a very big... I've got a lot of, of minis just in front of me right now. I have not put them away. It just it makes me happy to look at them, to just be like, yes. Though some of them are kind of like megas than minis. They're very big. Anyway, sorry about the distraction. Uh, no problem. <laughs> no problem. Uh, Jeremy, you want to get into it? Uh, yeah, <laughs> Blood Deuce, yes, my camera can move. It's a webcam. <laughs> yeah, anyway, let's talk about monster tactics. So we're really going to be talking about a lot of different archetypes of monster tactics, more than just specific monsters. You know, you could get into the nitty gritty of goblins and a bunch of different situations and environments, um, and you can do that for every monster in the book. We're going to be taking more overarching wide sweeps of things, and um, we'll and reference using, specific monsters. Yeah, from using some of those as kind of good example points to represent exactly. larger archetypes. And, uh, I mean, a big thing about this is a lot of monsters, their actual challenge, right, how hard they are to fight, varies a lot for some creatures based on what you're, how you're playing them. You take, like, a black bear, for example. Uh, you take the stats for a black bear, it's a black bear. There's not really any issue with it. it. All it has is two attacks and a bunch of hit points. It doesn't have any skills, doesn't have any special tactics. 
it's just going to run at your allies, at the, bat, at the players, and attack them with its claws. Whereas you take a more tactically minded monster that has maybe like, uh, can stealth or can use the hide action as a bonus action, like the goblins, Ooh. and you start to get more, more nuanced, interesting combat where if goblins just run at, your, at the players and swing their swords, those goblins are going to get mowed over. But if they play tactically, it could be a really challenging fight. And uh, this is a really important thing to keep in mind when you have players that are just rolling over your monsters and kind of are looking for more of a challenge. Um, absolutely. Uh, and a lot of the times uh, you're going to, I think a lot of beginner DMs are going to experience that kind of stomp because they're going to look at their goblins and they're going to throw out their four goblins, which are supposed to be the perfect challenge rating for a party of level one heroes, implying that each hero is the same toughness as a goblin and all the goblins are going to get killed in one hit by attacks from the heroes. And the DM is going to be like, Man, I don't know what happened. All my monsters just keep getting beaten up. Uh, and it can also be pretty hard to challenge players, right? When you're not using the tactics that are intended for the monsters. Because like, oh, I threw four goblins against them and they wiped the floor with them. They were supposed to be hard. All right, I'll just throw stronger creatures. And then the party gets wiped. Because there's a point where the big stack of hit points that just swings its hammer is just stronger than the players. So that's another important thing about using these tactics when you're trying to make harder encounters is that you don't just set your players up to get wiped. Uh, and in the same regard, it can be a lot more fun to fight enemies that are fighting tactically because yeah. um, just like with any kind of bits of detail and, and tactics, I would say, are like the fine detail of combat. Um like with any detail, it'll make your players feel more immersed in the world around them. Like, oh, these goblins aren't just throwing themselves at us. They're they're thinking and they're fighting logically and they're trying to exploit weaknesses and they're doing things like, oh, they see we have a wizard. So they're going to shoot the wizard first because they're afraid of magic. Um, and it really can start to make your players feel immersed in the world while at the same time providing more challenge. And it feels good. Like, if you're just bowling over every threat like it's nothing that's not like there's no fulfillment at least for me and for a lot of players in that some players love that but give it to them every so often but you know so, it, it can feel good to overcome like a real legitimate challenge um, so jerry we've been talking about goblins a lot now uh, do you want to talk about goblins and that kind of uh guerrilla warfare style enemy first yeah, let's talk about gerblins. So we got little ger. We got a picture of a goblin down in like he's way over there in Pete's bottom right corner. That's uh, my friend. I named him Toby. Toby the Goblin. Is that uh, is that short for anything, or is it just Toby? Um, short for it, I think Tobias. Is it? Do goblins have that many syllables? Um, I think more realistically, his name is like Tob. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> there we go. That makes more sense. And and that's short for Toby. Anyway, that's short. That's short for Toby. Yeah. Um, so, oh, goblins. Ahead, you, you mentioned guerrilla warfare. Yeah. Do you want to do you want to go into that a little bit more? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I'd be happy to. Um, so goblins. <laughs> uh, we kind of alluded to this. Uh, to enumerate it more specifically, goblins have a feature called nimble escape which means that the goblin can take the disengage or hide action as a bonus action on each of its turns. That is the official rules text for Nimble Escape. And when you look at that, you think, oh, well, that's cool. They're good at running away. Um, which for starters, that little feature, it does a lot to characterize what a goblin is to it. In employing and using this feature a lot more, you're going to start to get the idea of what goblins believe, which is that they're going to fight efficiently. They don't want to get hurt. They just want to, if they're in any situation where there's danger, they're going to choose to run. Um, and you can begin to use this a little bit more effectively, like um, this concept of guerrilla warfare, which I'm assuming that everyone is familiar with to an extent, but basically these are hit and run tactics. Uh, goblins uh, can fight in a way where uh, perhaps the uh, the players are walking down uh, a lonesome road in a forested area, uh, and the goblins have arranged themselves, hiding behind trees uh, right on the outskirts of the battle. And what they'll do is they have a short bow, so they have ranged attacks, so they can fight from a distance. They'll fire uh, 
Uh, they'll fire a volley of arrows at the party from surprise. Um, hopefully, uh, you they know, hope they'll... They yeah, they hope they hit. Uh, maybe even get off a second volley if they do well enough in initiative. Uh, and take out as many players as, players as they can. But if their attack is unsuccessful and the players begin to like follow after them into the woods, those goblins will use those bonus actions, disengages, and hides uh, to run away from the players and get behind cover again uh, so that the players aren't able to ever kind of lock them down and uh, really get a, get a firm grasp on them. Uh, there's a great scene that I think is the perfect example of guerrilla warfare in the movie The Patriot, which barring the quality of Mel Gibson as an actor and the Patriot on the whole, uh, I think there's a great scene where him and his sons are employing some guerrilla tactics on the British, uh, where they're just taking out an entire huge battalion as three people by using these uh, just, you know, you shoot, you run, you move on. And that can be really, like, terrifying for a player, I think. Absolutely. You know, a lot of players don't think of goblins as terrifying. They're, oh, they're just goblins. They live in the cave, we kill them whatever and this is a really interesting way of making that like more interesting right like pete was mentioning goblins in the forest if the players attack the goblins cave for example and so the goblins are you know ducking behind stalactites firing their bows running deeper into the cave and the players back off and retreat and the players go through the forest back to the town and they camp out and they heal up and they get ready to go back the next day goblins aren't dumb they have an intelligence of 10 um and that's something i i really like to look for when we're talking about monsters is how intelligent are they and they're pretty smart 10 is pretty smart smart is smart as smart as the average person yeah yeah so you know those goblins knowing the adventures will probably come back will duck out in the woods and the players go to walk into the woods and they get rained on by arrows and they chase the goblins off into the woods and the goblins retreat. And it's like, oh, we scared them off. Great. But then, you know, the players continue traveling to the woods toward the cave and, oh, they get attacked by these goblins again that just fire a volley of arrows and then run away. And it just, you just repeat that. And the players start getting really scared because then they're at less than half their hit points and they're realizing, shit, we are going to retreat now, but we have to retreat through the woods filled with goblins. Oh, we should have done this before we were at half our hit points. And that becomes a really scary situation. Whereas if you just have the goblins just sit in their cave, that the players know the layout of the cave now and know all of the tricks, that would have just been a slaughter. The players walk in and kill all the goblins. And when these kind of lower level threats have that degree of realism, um, then it starts to justify why heroes are the ones dealing with them too. Like, this is why peasants don't put together mobs and go out into the woods after the goblins, because that's the goblins' home territory, and they know how to fight there. Like, villagers are terrified of goblins, for good reason, because they are, uh, because they are really nasty and really mean, uh, and have these, like, terrible tactics they can use. Or terrible I... <laughs> in a devastating way, not in like a, they're good tactics. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I, I, I really like goblins. Um, another important thing is like, how does, even in just a normal, like flat out fight where the goblins aren't retreating, right? So let's say they're in the cave and the goblins are making their last stand because there's nowhere to really retreat to. How does using that ability affect the goblins actual like challenge, how hard they are? Well, first, if the goblins are hiding every turn, if they successfully hide, the player can't attack them, right? If they have somewhere to hide, the goblins leap into the pile of hay that they sleep in and burrow themselves down in there. You can't see them. You cannot see that the character. You know they're in that hay bale, and so your attack has disadvantage. And that is a huge, huge... Um, just statistical advantage toward the goblins just because you chose to use that ability uh, during the combat. And contrary-wise, you know, if um, the goblins leap out from being hidden and fire away uh, with their bows or stab with their scimitars, well, they have advantage because they're coming out of hiding. They're coming out, they're being these unseen attackers against the players. And these kinds of... Um, just tack like these mathematical advantage and disadvantage is really really meaningful 
for especially for goblins that have seven hit points, right? A good hit kills them. Players having disadvantage to hit them, that's huge for them. So those are also important things to kind of note here, right? Um, and this whole archetype, because this was, um, we're talking about this as an archetype and this idea of this gorilla tactic, this can be scaled up really well to any other monster. Any monster that you think would fight in this manner, you can, you know, play them like this. Maybe they don't necessarily have the nimble escape feature, but maybe they have other features that allow them to kind of hide uh, and to get into positions where they won't be noticed. Uh, Jeremy, I think you'd mentioned before, uh, the shadow is a great example of this. Yeah, the shadow is another great, great example of a, a very common um, guerrilla warfare monster, right? Whereas you kind of expect to find goblins in a cave or a forest or maybe a swamp or something. You find a shadow in a, uh, in, a in a house, right? A haunted house. Or maybe you find it in a graveyard or something like that. And one of the things that the shadow has, it has a feature called amorphous, which basically means uh, what it says is the shadow can move through areas as narrow as one inch without squeezing. So it can just go through cracks in the floorboards or little holes in the walls or things like that. Um, keyholes. Like, the shadow can just move through those. And that is a terrifying, terrifying tactical reality, right? The shadow comes out through the keyhole, attacks you, drains some of your strength, and retreats and waits until it can pick someone out in the open. That's another hallmark of, of these kinds of creatures. They really want, if they can, with their kind of ambush, to go after characters that put themselves out on their own. And then uh, that concept of giving advantage and disadvantage via stealth, uh, making it harder to attack them and easier for them to attack you, that scales into late game monsters really well. Advantage and disadvantage are just as impactful at high level play as they are at low level play. Or maybe not quite, but uh, very close to it. I agree. Um, so, uh, Jeremy, do you want to move on to like another kind of category of uh, of enemies? Yeah, I think I think that's a pretty good idea. And just well, one last thing about that before we just move on, actually, is you know uh, this kind of tuck and go um, a, a thing we talked about goblins, we talked about shadows, but you can apply that to any kind of creature that can that can get away, right? That can move quickly. Um, I also love the idea, right, of goblins maybe caring about each other, right? They take the disengage action and get behind the other goblins when they get injured, if they're still alive, right? God forbid. <laughs> but they don't actually care about each other. Uh, yeah, let's let's move on to another another topic, Pete. Uh, what do we want to? <clears throat> excuse me. What do we want to talk about now? Um, I, I I don't know. What was the uh, what was the first one that you had on your list? Was it the uh, the onkeg, perhaps? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the onkeg. I love the onkeg. Actually, um, wait, Jeremy, before we get into it, I just want to point out one comment in chat um, from an organic artist here. Having ropes to swing across bar barriers that have been placed along the enemy treat path are also very useful and also very realistic. Um, absolutely. These are the kind of things that with um, these people, you're moving into their environment. You can absolutely, like, they just have a better knowledge of the area and they're prepared for it. I think that's a great point. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's the kind of thing those gorilla... Uh, tactics will set up right they'll have traps set up in the forest if they're planning on attack you attacking you right they'll have like net traps or rope traps or something that's or pit traps or whatever that's the kind of stuff you would employ with those more gorilla minded um bows but uh yeah let's talk about the on cake an entirely entirely different um brand i guess it functions kind of similarly but in a less discreet kind of way so the Ankeg, for those who don't know, uh, is a large insectoid creature. Um, it is a huge, mon a large monstrosity, and its hallmark, it looks basically like a giant, like, ant thing. It's like a big fantasy monster ant. Yeah, big fantasy monster bug. Um, and like all fantasy monster bugs, it spits acid. <laughs> um, that's like its hallmark move. It has a big acid spray that it <clears throat> launches out for 30 feet. But more than that, it also has a burrow speed. There are not a lot of monsters in 5th edition D&D that have burrow speed. The Ankeg does. And that's kind of what makes it special. Um, it also has tremor sense out to 60 feet, meaning if something is touching the ground within 60 feet of an Ankeg, the Ankeg 
knows it's there. Unlike the goblins, which are intelligence 10 sentient creatures, Onkags are intelligence 1. Uh, they are monsters that are just hunting. And that gives them a really interesting kind of um, tactical position to play them from. I mean, I don't know about you, Pete, but I see people playing against Onkags, like, not all the time, but I've seen it quite a few times on streams and things like that. And every time, it's just the Onkeg runs up and attacks you. And I've always, I've always hated that. Um, you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. Because there's so many interesting things you can do when you have this whole degree of movement that almost no other creatures in the game have. Um, and I think, uh, to start with the most obvious one, the Onkeg just comes up from underneath you and attacks you. Uh, they are a very uh, a very easy kind of unseen attacker. Uh, and uh, you'll notice that a lot of these archetypes we're talking about all include ambushing, but in kind of different ways. Uh, yeah. And that is one of the, I mean, catching the enemy by surprise is the quintessential tactic. Um, that is kind of the tactic, uh, doing things that your, uh, uh, your enemies and your opponents don't expect. Uh, and not many people expect for a giant ant to come up under their feet and just pincer them from the ground. Well, and it gets worse than that, because that bite attack that they have also grapples. Oh, this yeah. is a creature that can burrow through the ground and can take you with it, uh, which is a terrifying prospect. Uh, it's very slow as it burrows. It only has 10 feet of burrow speed. But these creatures can be a turn away from locking you down, like, underground with it. You know, they come up onto the ground, bite you. And then next turn, they're just going to drag you down if you're not out of there. Um, and that, like, that's terrifying. It's very much like the gelatinous cube, where if you get stuck in the gelatinous cube, oh, well, you know, you get out of the gelatinous cube. That's the strat. <laughs> you don't stay in the cube. Um, and these are just a very interesting alternative kind of very scary monster. Um there's um, there's not much scarier right? than fight. I was gonna say there's not much thing scarier than fighting them inside of their tunnels too, uh, because oh, yeah. then all of a sudden you're kind of hit with this thought process. Any player that gets pulled underground by an onkeg, no one looks at the giant ant bug and thinks, "Well, this is the only one." <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, <laughs> no one thinks that. But you know, I also really love with playing with that burrow speed when i'm playing with onkegs i'm always using that burrow speed. always using it the players often don't know how many onkegs they're playing they're fighting until the battle's over and even then did some run away did they kill them all they don't know because oh an onkeg pops up over there and spits acid at you and then goes underground an onkeg pops up over there and like what's going on Right, because they have this big acid spit ability, and what's going to come out? Who's going to chase the onkeg underground into its hole while it recharges its acid spray? Right, if it's like a truly desperate onkeg, it might just pop up to acid spray you every so often, and it knows exactly where you are because it's got tremor sense. Um, the great tactic of the onkeg is that it requires your players to also play tactically. Right, if onkegs start attacking them. What do they do? Well, you climb up a tree, right? That's something you can do. And that's cool, right? That's the players are coming up with a cool solution to this combat puzzle that is the Onkeg. So um, when you're... Yeah, I, I love that. Uh, when your tactics that you're using from your enemy have like responses like that, yes. that's the sign of great combat. Um, a sign of, I think great tactics but really unengaging combat uh, is a tactic that they recommend i may have mentioned this on stream before <laughs> a ta tactic they recommend for the blue dragon in the monster manual where it just goes up to its height and it breathes lightning on down on you from out of its from out of anything that you have in range uh and then kind of flies up again and just waits for its lightning breath to recharge and kills you from a distance with lightning in an open desert that is Incredible tactics, really effective, great job. That's not engaging or fun for the players. Uh, I mean, there's no, things sucks. they can do. They can like, you know, oh, well, we'll try and bury, burrow underground or come up with some solution to it. But that's not an engaging combat. Uh, you want to find those tactics that really like, like Jeremy was just saying, have that kind of counterplay options where it makes your players think about how do we fight this? Yeah, and I mean, that's the main reason I wanted to bring up the Onkeg here is 
you know, I've seen them fought against in a couple of different adventures, like on streams, but not nearly enough because this is such an interesting enemy to battle. It plays that cool up and down above the ground. It's not really too busted. I don't think anything the Keg does is going to kill anyone in one hit unless they're, you know, level one. So, or if it crits and rolls really well. Um, but yeah, Ankegs are great. Um, really engaging with that burrow, that third dimension um, is, is really nice because it's different than flying. Flying is not really a third dimension. It is, but it's not, right? Because you can still yeah. shoot. There's still ranged attacks. Spells completely don't care. Underground is so... It's a real third dimension to combat. And it's really cool. As one last... Um, as one last note on the subject, another great thing you can do with Onkegs, uh, if you've had them fight Onkegs before, maybe later on they encounter some Onkegs that are being controlled by someone. Uh, in mm -hmm. which case, now imagine that same stat block, but acting under a higher powers intelligence uh, because there's so many cool things you could do with that too. Uh, you know, setting up burrowed traps, having uh, kind of pitfalls with like the dirt underneath their feet that they fall into. And then a whole bunch of on kegs swarm. Uh, that same concept can be applied to a lot of different monsters. Um, I, I think another good example that's like the opposite terrain of the on keg um, might be like a pack of giant spiders, uh, all kind yep. of making their webs in the tree where you essentially have the underground above ground where the spiders have this odd extra degree of movement uh, where they can walk in this kind of webbed terrain. Um, and it works the same way actually with spiders, right? Because yeah. Anke has got tremor sense. They know everything going on in the ground. Spiders have web sense. They know everything touching their webs. So, you know, it's actually a, a really direct comparison there. I really like that. Um, um Spiders are a little more commonly used, I think, than on cakes, though. Yeah, <laughs> uh, spiders are a, a popular one. I use them all the time. I love I love using giant spiders. Um, what do we want to talk about next, Pete? We got a couple more, like, really interesting ones on. Um, I wouldn't mind going for that devious shape-shifting fiend. Oh, the water element. Yeah. No, of course. Yeah, let's talk about Pete's favorite monster, the Rakshasa. Hey, guys. I really like these big tigers. <laughs> um... The Rakshasa is my favorite monster because it is a really unconventional fighting style that the Rakshasa has. Uh, because while the rest of these monsters were talking about tactics in terms of kind of, you know, hit and run combat and, and ways that they can kind of ambush, the Rakshasa also uses the art of surprise, like, like all monsters, I suppose. But they do so in a much different way, where they get to know you uh, and then they surprise you. Um, the Rakshasa's kind of core feature, uh, and the one that defines them most, is their ability to change appearances. They can change their shape, size, take on a number of different humanoid forms. There's one simple tell that gives them away that it requires you to have been a player uh, of Dungeons & Dragons for a while to probably recognize, which is that their hands are backwards, uh, so that their palms are on essentially the back of their hands. Pete, that's uh, why they have disguise self, so they can undo them. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh... I feel like disguise self doesn't undo it. In eh. just my in just my brain, I've always thought that was something that was just undisguisable. Uh, but I guess you could just do that. That feels like cheating. It feels like cheating, Jeremy. They're devious, Pete. That's true. one of the things I love about the Rakshasa, right? Is because, like, okay, one thing. So you hear this all the time. Stories about like, oh my goodness, the big betrayal. We've been playing this campaign for a bazillion years and we have this wizard who's been our best friend for like, since, since section two and they just betrayed us dramatically. You know what's more dramatic than that wizard betraying you? That wizard's been dead for fucking eight years and replaced by a Rakshasa. That's more dramatic. Uh, it's way more dramatic. <laughs> Uh, likewise, if you want to have, like, the impact, because a lot of the times those dramatic betrayals can kind of be, feel like, oh, man, everything we've done this whole time was just, we were just being used, that feels bad. So you get, like, the moment drama of the dramatic betrayal when the Rakshasa impersonates that wizard uh, and uses it to get close and attack the party. But then you find out, like, oh, it was just a Rakshasa, the wizard's fine, everything's still cool. So you get to have your cake and eat it, too, in that situation. Absolutely. Um, uh, so, so the Rakshasa has a lot of abilities, but in terms of their combat effectiveness, they aren't 
you know, for their challenge rating of 13, uh, they oh, have a really, very low. yeah, uh, they have a lot of, um, uh, they have a lot of magic immunity, which makes them really effective against spellcasters. But outside of that, they get beat up really easy, uh, really easily by anyone that's kind of martial in nature. Uh, watch our most recent D&D time delves from this past week to see the worst way to use a Rakshasa. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, I mean that was not intended to be a challenge. It was I, meant to be more. Yeah, that was a that was a joke. Um, <clears throat> but yeah. you'll see how much the Rakshasa just gets beat up almost instantly without it using its tactics and its manipulation. I agree. Now, one of the things I love about the Rakshasa here is it has its claw attack. Right, uh, plus seven to hit, reach five, one target does a little, you know, not like a ludicrous amount of damage, right? 2d6 plus 2, that's not a lot for level 13. Um, but it curses the creature oh, yeah. when it hits. And there's no save, it just curse. And what the curse says, whenever the creature takes a short or long rest, the creature's thoughts are filled with horrible images and dreams, and they regain no benefit from the short or long rest. A Rakshasa in, like, a city campaign? Well, what if they cast Disguise Self to look just like a random person and they go into the bar and there's the barbarian in there drinking, doing whatever and just punch the barbarian in your in its disguised form. And that barbarian becomes cursed. It has no idea why they're not getting the benefits from their long rest. And then another player. And then another player. And the Rakshasa can just whittle them down and they got no idea what's going on. How are they going to know? Like, okay, they're each getting attacked a little bit randomly on the uh in the city, but how do they hunt that how do they hunt that down? Right? If the Rakshasa knows they're onto them or if they're interfering with the Rakshasa's plans, that's a really frightening thing. Because they don't realize they're cursed. They don't know why they're not getting these benefits, so they probably don't think, oh, let me remove curse real fucking quick, right? They're just also, confused. In the same regard, they probably don't think, oh, it was that like burly ruffian I tavern brawl that inflicted this terrible yeah, nightmare right. curse upon me. Um, there's, a, there's a lot you can do in terms of role playing and, and deception and establishing great moments. Also, the Rakshasa, you know, meeting with someone that's a friend, I think Critical Role had a great example of this where they did this, uh, where you don't expect, it's not suspicious if an NPC asks to speak to you alone. Because they're not a monster, what's wrong with just talking to your friend? What was their Tob? Gilmore. What's wrong with talking to your goblin friend Tob uh, um, about some personal matters that he wants to discuss? Uh, and well, that's the perfect kind of isolation, uh, that divide and conquer aspect, which is another one of if there's one of the core tactics in existence is surprise. Uh, dividing the enemy is another kind of core tactic. And an important thing to note about this Rakshasa, Rakshasa has two skills. It has, it does not have stealth. It has deception and it has insight. If a player is at all getting suspicious of the Rakshasa, the Rakshasa knows it. That's what that plus eight to insight really means. And so if someone starts, if your player starts to get suspicious of the Rakshasa, blah, blah, blah. Have the Rakshasa backpedal. Have them play more defensively, right? Have them be, like, in that social kind of conversation, act hurt, right? Or what have you. Um, you, can, you can play to that. Like, that, that is perfectly within the reason. I, one of the things I also really love is, like, the players who are really into their zone of truth and the Rakshasa just being like, <laughs> yes, let me go into your zone of truth real quick. <laughs> um just i just tell infinite lies he can just say whatever he wants and then it becomes canon oh that because... is because rakshasas have limited magic immunity by the way for yeah. those who aren't aware they are immune to spells of sixth level or lower unless they wish to be affected that's good i've never seen that particular one come up before but that's a really good that's one a very very nice one i love it um Jeremy, do you want to uh, move on to another well, another guy? Pete, we or didn't you... talk about the Rakshasa in another... There's another context to them, Pete. I thought you'd want to talk more. What's the other context that you wish to talk about them in, Jeremy? Well, you know, you're fighting the Rakshasa, right? Or you find out this thing's a Rakshasa. But here's the thing. What is the Rakshasa doing? 
Like, what's it doing in, like, the, the town, right? Has the Rakshasa moved ah, its yes. way up to leading this order of paladins within the town? If so, what are you going to do? Tell the paladins their leader is a demon? Or, I'm sorry, a, a fiend? And they will go and use their divine sense, and you as a GM will be like, yeah, I'm going to rule that that's lower than 6th level, because it's lower than 6th level teacher, technically. Uh, yes, and, yes. you know, none of the paladins know it's a Rakshasa, and then the Rakshasa tells the paladins, no, they're the fiends, and then, then the paladins kill you, right? The Rakshasa is awesome in playing neutral or even good parties against the players. I love that so much. Um, or evil I, parties. I mean, that works I too, but... I agree 100%. Uh, the king's the king and his guard, uh, where the king is a rakshasa, is a great archetype that you can do with them. Yeah, and you can do the same thing with doppelgangers, right? Doppelgangers oh, yeah. or um, uh, even wizards. You can just have like a, a shape shifting like wizard or something with a, a disguise self spell. That's a little easier to foil, but you know you can play with a lot of these kind of archetypal um, trick you kind of um, m- m- deception base monsters and that's a really interesting and engaging tactic for players to come up against i think obviously I, pete also thinks so uh, yeah I, pete picked the mock shot is, is my favorite thing uh, <laughs> i've spent a lot of time just sitting around thinking about rakshasas in my time um oh and it's like... not like we're covering everything about the rakshasa by the way like you know, and all of these monsters, there's so much depth we could go it's, into. It's a versatile, versatile character. We could do a like a we could do case studies on the Rakshasa. Um, but uh, for the sake of uh, uh, for the sake of moving to the next one, Jeremy. Yeah. What's yeah. next on our chopping block? Uh, I wanted to talk about animated objects. Yeah, I was interested in this one. Uh, this is an interesting I picture. I uh, love animated. Objects. Tell us why you love animated objects, Jeremy. So animated objects, I love for the same kind of... It's not just animated objects. It's animated objects and their creator. No, I'm actually not talking about Mimics by Onyx Shiva. Um, but, uh, oh, take care, nerds, for taking off. Or the nerds good, table. Good night. But, uh, yeah, I love, I love animated objects. I love them. They are pretty weak, generally speaking. They don't have a high challenge rating. But I think there's some really nuanced and interesting ways to use them, right? If you have your players walk into the treasure room and they're like, ah, there's a bunch of arm, you know, plate, perfect plate armors lined up against the walls. Players are going to say like, all right, I know what's going on here. And they're going to take out their weapons. And they'll be like, all right, we're going to fight these plate armors because they're going to come to life and attack us. And the players walk over and attack them and they fight back. Well, all right, you've lost the element of surprise. That's not fun anymore, right? They just are now in a combat where it's them piles of, of hit points and armor versus the animated armor's pile of hit points. And, and yeah, it's not yeah. exciting. But what could be exciting is they go and they attack the first armor thing and it falls over. And they're like, oh, okay, it's just plate armor. Sick, I want to wear that. They go put on the plate armor and they go later down the dungeon and they go into the next chamber, right? With like the, the mage of the dungeon, you know, you know, use whatever wizard template you want from the player's handbook or Xanathar's guide to everything. Um, or just, you know, make your own wizard from the player's handbook. And the wizard says, hi, you will fall in directly from my trap. And then the door slam shut. And then right. The armor animates. And they're like, ah, sh- we could have killed all of them, right? Uh, and, and I they, love that because and it's they inf- fall prone. Yeah, <laughs> I love it because it's it's enforcing the, um, what do you call it? The paranoia of we should have just smashed every armor, right? When you enforce paranoia with your monsters, you get your players to really get into it, right, and engage with it on like a oh shit, oh, like, it's scary. The same way we were talking about the goblins earlier. Um, the same idea goes for, especially at early levels, right, where a flying sword is a real thing, like an actual monster that you can use. Oh, yeah. Um, hell, yeah. Yeah, you walk through the dungeon and class, I think, yeah. you see lying in the goblins, like, pile of, of random loot, there's some chewed-on leather armor and a rusted helmet and a 
perfectly fine sword, unblemished by rust or decay or anything. It even glows a little bit. The players are like, oh, sick, Ooh, a magic sword. Magic and they weapon. drop they drop their crappy mace from the ground, they pick up the magic sword, and then they keep going through the dungeon, and they get to whatever controls that magic sword later on, and that magic sword, whoever controls this, attack. And suddenly, ah, you're fighting your sword as it's trying to kill you, and you don't have another weapon. That kind of stuff is, I think, what really makes animated objects awesome. Uh, and memorable as well. And, and it doesn't Absolutely. necessarily have to be, like, if the players don't fall for these tricks or decide to, like, leave the animated sword alone, an animated sword is just as funny and has that same impact when a wizard wields it, wields it at you, uh, and then they hit you with it, and then they just let it go, and then the sword keeps fighting you. Even that in of itself is, like, a fun kind of trick and surprise, uh, where especially they don't expect maybe, like, the two goblin soldiers that the wizard is employing when they fall down for their swords to get up and keep fighting. Um, yep. Uh, those are both like really kind of uh, fun tricks that you can employ uh, to like retake even the element of surprise mid a combat where they think the combat is done and that second kind of layer to it suddenly appears. And I mean, you can do the same exact thing with intellect devour where, you know, you kill the hobgoblin and then its head pops open and an intellect devourer jumps out, right? Um, so, uh, I mean, there back are Back to many my animated... Of... Sorry, sorry. Uh, I was laughing at V-Bunny's comment. My animated comment. brain. Oh. Oh, uh, right. But... Yep. V-Bunny, you're correct. That's, that was what we were getting to the whole time. We were always headed here. <laughs> uh, Farful saying no intellect devourers. Oh, I'm not saying you have to use them. I'm just saying you could use them in the exact same way to get that element of, oh, shit, wait, we're not done yet. Um, uh, and in terms of like interesting tactics with animated objects, um, also just, and this maybe doesn't necessarily apply to this, but think about what you can do with spells. Because like, say you're having a wizard that can just cast the spell animate objects. Think about like what animating a particular object can do. Uh, I've seen someone play, they animated like, I, I think you get to animate eight tiny things, is it? Yep. Uh, they animated eight tiny gloves and would use their animated gloves to go around and do tasks like pick up little daggers and like uh, run around and like, you know, if they were in a puzzle, they would use them to hit buttons and stuff. And you can have enemies do that kind of stuff too. Uh, the reach of your, uh, the reach of your monsters uh, is, is often like, very much in your imagination, you know? Like the animated noose. Oh, oh. brutal. <laughs> Ru Oof. Uh, I but don't yeah, no, want to fight I, I, that. No, I don't either. I don't want to make that either. Um, but anyway, yeah, I love animated objects for that exact reason. You find a magic cloak, and later on you find the person who controls that magic cloak, and it's just, oh, shit. Right? A lot of times, if, if a player puts on a magic item, and they find out they can't attune to it, but they don't, but you say, yeah, you, you're not sure what magical effect it's giving you, but it's definitely magic. They're going to keep that shit on every time. And I, I really like that kind of stuff. I mean, and the book has animated sword, right? Or flying sword is like the only real example. But you could do the same thing with a staff or, hell, animated boots, um, anything like that. I love the idea of animated boots being like, nope, you're running over there now. <laughs> bye bye. Animated no, the boots run you directly toward the cliff. Animated box. Your halfling companion is now inside of it. Oh, jeez. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Crowley bringing up my, my old crab armor. Oh, that was heinous. Uh, I, uh, I had magic armor that would slowly constrict and crush your, your ribs until you died because it was actually a crustacean, and that's how it ate. That's terrifying, for sure. Yeah, they put it on immediately after finding it with a skeleton that just purposely had its ribs all crushed in, even though it was wearing plate armor that was on. Yeah, that's a, that's a bad call. That wasn't my on fault. their part. Um, uh, Farkle says no intellect devourers. Uh, intellect devourers are an interesting example of monster that needs no tactics because you just have them use their ability and the party dies. Uh, or they are pretty pretty scary. Yes. Um, so, uh, Jeremy, anything else you wanted to say on the subject of animated stuff? Um, just that you can be creative as to when it animates. That's really, I think, the nuance in animated objects. It's when it comes to life. Uh, when it attacks enemies. 
Uh, and to extend on that a little bit, uh, I think you can come up with a lot of other monsters that have the same effects. Your yeah. blights, which disguise themselves as plants. Your mimics, which disguise themselves as pretty much anything. Um, yep. A lot of monsters use that particular tactic. Um, and you can apply those rules to it. Uh, Absolutely. And it's, it's the deal with that, right? Like, if your players are going around smashing everything in the place they are because they're terrified of animated objects and they're killing your animated objects before they get to go, that's not a bad thing. That's a very good thing. It means you have driven them to this point of paranoia that is, it's, they're, they're getting it, right? They're engaging with that fear, I guess, for lack of a better word. So let's start talking about that next. We got, we got two more, I think, right? Um, yeah. Two more on our list. Uh, we um, might not get to all of them. The last one's not super important, but let's talk about, let's talk about the elementals. Yeah, sure. Um, elementals uh, are, for anyone who's not familiar, just an element made flesh. There's the fire and uh, air elemental, which you see on the screen there. Uh, there are also water and earth elementals in the player's handbook. In theory, anything could be an elemental, uh, but it's just something made of a, a pure element. Uh, and I want to, before we get into this, go way back to a comment that V-Bunny made early on that I was like, oh, this would be very good when we're talking about elementals. Uh, and that was, uh, he said... What about monster layers like that of a dragon, that they have design having their own kind of body abilities in mind uh, in order to avoid their own traps or, you know, things that would not affect them because they can easily bypass them or are immune to it. Um, so, for example, I think the obvious example is a red dragon sleeping within a volcano. They don't care about anything that the volcano does, but the, that's a terrifying terrain for players to be in because if they fall into lava, they basically die instantly um, unless they have fire immunity also for some reason. And elementals are very much the same way. They are masters of the particular terrain in which they are fighting. If you are fighting underground, an earth elemental is an incredible threat because it can fly through the uh, it can fly through the ground like a bird flies through the sky. Um, a water elemental in water. It just looks like water. Uh, it's It just becomes invisible. <laughs> Good luck because, with that one, mate. <laughs> uh, I've run that against Jeremy before. Um, and <laughs> it can just be in the water, uh, and you won't be able to find where it is because it looks completely identical to its surroundings. Uh, the same thing can apply to the fire elemental and the air elemental. They are... Uh, in the sky, an air elemental is an incredible threat, can disturb enemy flight, things like that. And if you're in an inferno, the fire elemental is immune to fire, naturally. So uh, the players will be taking damage that it just ignores. Yeah, uh, I I really like elementals. These are a little more situational, right? Because they have to be in a certain place. But, you know, you can roll a little bit more. So let's let's say that you have a fire elemental, right? If there's a burning building that the players have to go into for some reason, let's say an evil wizard set their base on fire, and you have to go in to get your stuff. Having that wizard put a fire elemental in there is horrifying. Because not only is everything on fire, but the fire is alive and trying to ex like explicitly kill you. Really adds to the fear of, of the situation. And we can imply a lot of those same tactics that we've applied elsewhere to other monsters here. For example, the players walk past some innocuous flames and then they rise up and strike with surprise. Uh, or yeah. the players fight the fire element a little bit and it retreats into the fireplace uh, to kind of just meld in with some of the surrounding flames and then hits and runs later. Um, the having... water elemental grapples you and drags you to the bottom of the ocean. Oh, God, that's such a bad one. Uh, the earth elemental just works with its works with its onkeg partners uh, to just pull you <laughs> underground and then leave you there buried. Um, the earth are... elemental's real weird. It doesn't actually have a burrow speed, does it? No, it has this thing called earth glide. Earth glide, yeah. Which means it doesn't change the earth when it moves through. Uh, it just kind of flies through it. Uh, but I would, in my brain, it feels wrong that it can't do that because it has a physical form yeah, no, and punch and move. Um, and that's also just a question of if you think something is cool and would be really engaging, just 
give the Earth Elemental the ability to do that. I mean, think about how that affects its CR and how much more difficult it makes the fight. If the Earth Elemental can do something like reach out, grab a player by the legs, and then drag them down to their waist so they're just, like, restrained in dirt, that's a much harder enemy than one that can't do that. But it's also a really terrifying tactic and would make a pretty memorable fight, I think. Yeah, and engaging these Elementals specifically in traps or puzzle rooms in dungeons are a really cool way to use them. If there's a wall of fire and the player's like, man, we can't figure out a way around this wall of fire, let's just jump through it. And then they get grappled trying to jump through the wall of fire. Oh, shit, that's going to change the game, right? That's a really fucking terrifying moment to ask them, roll for initiative, you're grappled in a wall of fire, right? That's horrifying. It might still be another two rounds before they even realize there's a fire elemental that's doing it and not some bullshit magic. Um, you know, likewise, they find a flooded chamber in the ruin. Oh, well, water elemental, boy. Uh, it engulfs you, overwhelms you in the water. You can't breathe. You can't even call out, which is a terrifying way for your character to die. Um, but it's really dramatic, too, right? And it, again, your character probably won't die unless you're totally splitting off like an idiot. But you know, it's dramatic and it's exciting. And I think it's a lot of fun. I really like using these elementals, especially in a trap. Their... Way. Exactly. Almost like traps. Um, more than just monsters. They, um, they take a puzzle or a trap and turn it into a combat in addition to being a cool puzzle or trap. Yeah. The fire and water elemental in particular are yeah. really great for this. Um, the I mean, air, air elemental, elemental works in a, a room of fog. Perfect. Oh, yeah, that's terrifying, too. Yeah. I mean, a fog cloud's scary enough. Yeah, fog is just such a terrifying weather pattern. It's probably the really scariest is. weather. You're just blind, yo. Um, or hell, you could use a fire elemental and an air elemental because you got smoke, right? Pfft, why not? And and this is the category of, you know, creatures that are suited to their particular environments. Uh, and, you know, they all kind of bleed into each other a little bit. But like V-Bunny was saying, dragons fall into this area. Uh, anything with any kind of resistance can make use of that in this particular way by, you know, if it has acid immunity, uh, going into like the bubbling, like a acidic marshland is equally threatening as like a, a fire inferno. A fire inferno is my favorite kind of fire exactly pete exactly um, um i really like these kinds of creatures i think they're really cool anything that can breathe underwater really falls under this category too if they're in the water just because of how aquatic co combat rules kind of work in fifth edition DD. but yeah i don't know i really like elementals as kind of the quintessential example of these because they literally are where they are best yeah yeah um but yeah, I think that about wraps it up. We were going to talk a little bit about the Kenku, but the Kenku kind of falls under that same category of like the goblins and the uh, the Rakshasa, where it tries to deceive you and ambush you, and it's the same idea. Yeah, the it's only kind difference of like a is it's got there. yeah, it's got the mimicry feature, which lets it mimic uh, exact voices too, which is cool. Um, but yeah, that's, it's, that's, it's a great like low level Rakshasa if that's what you're. Oh, looking absolutely. For. 100%. Um, it's terrifying. It's really, I really actually, the one thing I will say about the Kenku, what I really like to use them in is when a player does wander off, right? And if they do split the party, like someone goes to scout ahead, I really like the situation where the player's scouting ahead, they're doing all this stuff kind of in solo where everyone else is waiting for them to come back, they get into the combat encounter, and then you have everyone roll for initiative. And you describe for the party, yeah, you hear your friend scream out, ah, there are monsters ahead. And it's from a very different direction that they actually went because it's a different Kenku impersonating. Right? That's a really dramatic way to start off that encounter. And now that player who was all off on their own exploring is now fully alone. And I don't know, it can be tense. It adds to that drama, that tension, that excitement. That's even a fun trap if the players yeah. know about what the Kenku does and how they can only, the only thing they can do is things that they have heard. Uh, if the Kenku 
makes the sound of like your players being like, hurry, there's monsters ahead. We need you. Uh, and then they come and realize as they go to catch up to the sound that it's a Kenku, there's all of a sudden the realization like, oh no, my party's fighting monsters. Um, that's that's very dramatic. Like I, I have abandoned them in their time of need. Uh, yeah, and right. even if even if the Kenku is harmless uh, and it's just like just standing there, just kind of like messing with the person uh, or just trying to interact with them in any way they can, that's still a really cool and interesting way to use that monster. And I've seen them used for like creepy shit too. Like just trying to wig players out at night. Like you hear the sound of a baby crying in the graveyards. Just like, ah! <laughs> um, so, um, Jeremy, anything you want to say as we're kind of wrapping up here? Uh, uh, no, I think that's really about it. I mean, we talked a lot about a couple of different monsters here, but everything that we've said here can be applied to way more creatures in the monster manual and in Dungeons and Dragons, right? Um, the only reason you want to use these is to make combat more engaging, more interesting, more dangerous, and more dramatic for your players. If your players are already very engaged and they're having a lot of fun and they really are enjoying what they're doing without the extra challenge that these offer, you don't have to do them ever. Um, we would recommend, especially, I, I would recommend, especially if like for a uh, coming up toward like a boss battle or for something like that, to really engage some of these tactics a little more because they'll be more exciting, right? It'll add more drama to it. But you have uh, under no obligation to actually do this this is a kind of more advanced uh kind of thing is for a dungeon master it can be really hard to remember and execute these when you're playing yeah that's the that's so, the trick you know try it uh, don't go overboard just, but try it uh and when you're dming and you're doing your prep work just remember to... <laughs> sorry <laughs> what the kenku's actually trying to get help for its village it was attacked by monsters Oh no, the poor Kenku village. Uh. Uh, when you're looking at these monsters uh, and you're going over and prepping for your campaign and you look at a goblin or you look at a kobold with their pack tactics or you look at whatever low-level thing you're, you're choosing, really take a look at it and try and think about what it is that you can do with them. Yeah, I completely agree. And in the end, it's all just about making the game better, right? More fun for everyone involved. Keep that all in mind. Um, and but with that, I think this topic is concluded. Thank you, everyone, for hanging out with us. Uh, let's jump over to our, our segment we kind of end every episode of Talks with, or most of them, uh, which is Ask Beat and Jeremy, uh, where you can jump onto our Discord server. Uh, you can find links below the channel and everything. And you can go ahead and pop down to the Ask Beat and Jeremy channel and leave us a question. And we'll try to answer them. Uh, so without uh, further ado, uh, let's yeah. start moving through. Uh, I see Fark, who's got a meme. Who's your favorite D&D time player character, and why is it insert here? Uh, the answer is all of you. I love you all very much. Uh, <laughs> I love insert here. Uh, yes. Uh, Reflected 10-8, uh, what is your favorite way to start a new campaign? Jeremy, you want to go first? Favorite way to start a new campaign? That's a really hard question, because, like, I start new campaigns in lots of different ways. Um, yeah, it's obviously, gonna... like the super standard you start in a tavern kind of thing. And sometimes that's awesome because it's classic, right? Um, other times I like to, you know, I've started a campaign off in the middle of like a dramatic scene. Um, I've done that, I think once. And yeah, I've started it off in a bunch of different ways. So I, I can't really answer. There's not like one particular thing I do. Um, yeah, I like I like spicing it up. I think and it I depends. Think however it fits the tone of what I want to run. Yeah, exactly. I think it depends very heavily on what the campaign is and what you're trying to do with it. Um, my personal, if I had to pick one that I would say is my quote unquote favorite, one that I've gone back to before, uh, I really like doing kind of the, um, uh, I really like doing like a scene with each character that brings them into the first moment before it uh, is kind of like introduce everyone individually, give them a second of spotlight so the other players can kind of see and get used to playing with them before they play with them. I, it's it's good. Uh, it doesn't work for every game, and I don't use it in every game, but it's a it's a fun one. Feels satisfying when it works well. Yeah. Uh, and actually, I guess, like, Lance, to answer your question, there is one I have used multiple times um, that I like, and I guess it's it's the kind of picture of the player's life 
right, where I start the campaign off and we've determined what the player, what their characters like, lives are, what they do, right, their families, their relationships, whatever. Um, and we start from there, just so we have a strong opinion of like where everyone's starting from and even play out a couple of days of just their normal, you know, lives and goings on before something kind of propels them into the adventure proper. And so. and that's just good storytelling. I mean, that's the mono myth, uh, your hero's journey right there. Uh, begin in the begin in the normal world. Uh, Matty Morgs asks another question: What is one superstition that you have about dice, or if you don't abide by it, what is an interesting one that you know of? Pete, do you have any superstitions with dice? Uh, dice superstitions? Uh, I'm. S- I believe in the power of luck and that I have it. Well, actually, I don't have it right now. It's aside the point. Also. Uh, I always roll my one dice set for any time I need a D6, if that counts. I have one set of D6. I think I showed them on stream recently. I won't do it again now, but they're called the drama dice. I love them, and I use them always. Uh, I'm going to agree with Pete. I'm a convert of Tamora. I believe in luck and that I currently have it. Yeah, Jeremy has it right now. I've lost mine. Yeah, uh, I'm sure I'll lose it sooner or later, but right now I have it. I'm it's hoping. It's good to uh, have it. You know if you have it. Uh, I'm hoping uh, I'm hoping Tack and some of his halfling superstitions bring my luck back to me. Um, next question from Reflected108. When things are rough and the world seems to be against you, what's the one thing you can always think of that gives you the spark of, hey, things aren't that bad. Life is pretty good. You want to start or me? Uh, you go first. Um... I mean... This is a pretty a pretty deep one, but I know that things have been worse. And I know that I can make things better. So I guess it's that personal experience for me. That I have power over my own life, even if like, you know, money and everything else aside, you can choose to put yourself in a better place if you want to work to if you want to be there, you can make yourself get. So that's the answer I'm going to give you. That's like that's like a, a from the heart feels question. I think that's a great answer, and I don't have anything that I think will be as good as that. Um, that's fine. So I'll agree with you. I don't want to trivialize it by saying a joke. Well, uh, speaking of a joke, great, do you forgotten one answer. asks, when will the other world be powered of shrug emoji be part of the existence of D&D time? Hmm. Uh, with a shrug emoji. <laughs> yeah, and then asks, "What is one thing could be an NPC, a dungeon, a trap, anything that you have included in all of your campaigns?" <laughs> I'm a very powerful wizard. I have all manner of spells and incantations and so on and so forth, and uh, I do appear in a number of campaigns that I have run. Yes. Yes. Really? Uh, no, not really. I don't have anything. Uh, there's, there's not nothing. all of them, but in a lot of them. I've used Bartholomew, I think, like, four times. Uh, Crowley asked, uh, what is your sixth favorite monster? Probably the Intellect Devourer. Um, mine is going to be the... Oh, you're right, shit. My, no, I, I know the I don't the answer. Sorry, go ahead, Pete. You actually have an answer to this? No, not to this, to the other one. Um, I can't think of what my... I was trying to like actually do in my head really quick a list <laughs> of my six favorite monsters, but I can't get down that quickly in my brain. So I'm going to arbitrarily say the Hydra. I like Hydras a lot. They're good. I mean, realistically, the, the Intellect Devourer might actually be my sixth favorite. Um, but actually, to Bionic Sheba's last question, the one about like the thing that I've included in all my campaigns, I don't include it in every campaign, but I try to include it at least once for every group that I play with for like a, a, an actual amount of time. I try to include this magic item. And it is a jug that is, when you get it, it is empty. It's a magic jug. And whatever you put into it, it will create infinite of forever. Uh, or it'll create, it might be a certain amount of time per whatever. The, you know, it'll create like 20 pounds of whatever you put into it per day or something like that. Um, and 
Yeah, that that's an item I like to put into everyone because no one ever does it right. They filled it with water once. Our most recent group filled it with leaves. One of these days, Jeremy. Well, I can't give it to you now, Pete. You're going to be the only one to not get it. Well, yeah, I mean, no, I'm saying, but one of these days, you're going to get someone who's going to put their phoenix down in it or whatever the most broken thing you can think of that they could put in it is. Ooh, build a space whale might also be a new one reappearing in all my campaigns. Build a space whale is just forevers? He might be. I love build a space whale a lot. I'm a big fan of space whales. Um, um, next question from Crowley. <laughs> what is your least favorite citrus fruit? Um, Kiwi. The, the kumquat. I think that's a citrus fruit, and I've never eaten it, but it doesn't look good. What is your favorite ogre stat block, and why is it the howda? It's the howda, uh, and it's because it's the howda. Yeah, I mean, it's a ogre with a backpack. Oh, why wouldn't that be the best one? Bionic Shiba, I, I love citrus fruit. That's all I'm going to say to that. Uh, Crowley asks, oh, I'm sorry, Reflect 10 what's your favorite fae? Now that's like the question. the red cap. Um, I think. Oh, can I no, pick one I like the not... blink dog. Uh, mine isn't blocked yet, uh, so I can't really pick it. I don't know if I can pick it. I'm going to just pick it anyway. My favorite fae is the leprechaun. There you go. Uh, will, Crowley asks, like what's your favorite monstrosity? <laughs> the owl bear. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, get that's, good, an, that's get an good. Easy, that's an easy one for Jeremy. Uh, and mine is. Let me come back to it while I think about what monstrosities exist. Uh, Seabrack asks, "What is your favorite way? Uh, what is your personal favorite way to start creating a character? Do you have a class or race in mind when doing it, or do you have a personality chosen and form the race and class around that?" Ooh. That's a very good question. I'll be honest, usually for me, it's a race in class that no, it's not even a race in class. It's a picture. It's someone's incredible artwork that just I see and I say, fuck, I want to make that into a character. Um, so that's for me. I think my favorite monstrosity is a Sphinx, now that I've had some time to think about oh, it. That's a good choice. Yeah, that definitely is. Uh and with regard to my favorite way to start creating a character, um, I mean, it, it's really varied for me. Um, sometimes the race and class will just like inspire me, like my current character that I'm playing in, uh, that I'm playing in, why can't I remember, remember the name of it? Dragon Deep. Water Deep Dragon Water Heist. Deep Dragon Heist, Jesus. Uh, um, I just wanted to play a halfling. I knew that going in. I was like, I really want to be a halfling. So I built it around that. A lot of the times, for me, it's it's character voice first. I'll come up with a couple of things I want a character to say, uh, and then kind of build from there with what the impression I get is from that. Um, I don't know. I have, I have a lot of different kind of points of inspiration. Who is your favorite Marvel, Marvel hero to qualify the above in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? I'm not I, totally caught up. I haven't seen any of the Ant-Man movies or um, Captain Marvel. Um, I like Doctor Strange a lot. He's really cool. Like I, I no, it's Doctor Strange. <laughs> Never mind. I'm done. That was easy. I've always been a huge fan of the Hulk, but he hasn't like gotten as much time as yeah. I would want him to. So it's kind of hard to pick him. Well, also his uh, movies were bad. They well, were like yeah. the bad Marvel. I'm talking about the the uh what's his name hulk i can't remember the guy's name right now yeah i know i know what you're talking about yeah the current the current hulk the there were some bad eric, hulks the eric vanna hulk made me want to i went to see that shit on opening day uh first thing first ticket bought tickets in advance pre-ordered them and i saw the movie the hulk starring eric vanna so terrible uh, i guess if i have to pick i really love the guardians of the galaxy and any one of them alone isn't really strong enough to like they're kind of great in their collective um so i'll say tentatively guardians of the galaxy but if i had to pick one oh shit i i don't know i gamora. really like i really like rocket and gamora yeah yeah the gamora's the best uh rocket rocket's pretty good too. rocket had like those moments of like i care about things which makes him more than two-dimensional yeah. i'm just a crazy raccoon you look um, past the kind of i don't know i i like both of those characters quite a bit oh Cool question coming out from uh, Seabrack again. Have you ever adapted the D&D &D rules for a different time setting? And what time period would you like to use the D&D &D system with? 
ha huh. pete i know you have done that Shaboy, some might say shaboy uh, has spent a lot of time on this in a way more more than you know <laughs> uh i have 70 to 100 pages of a re-adaptation of D&D for, um, for sci-fi and future. It's called Space Funk. Uh, originally, I was going to not do Pete and Jeremy's D&D time. This was when I was just working on this on my own. And it was just going to be doing a podcast called Space Funk, which was going to be Space D&D. But we ended up doing D&D time. Uh, what a waste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i just got a huge pile of some i mean it was before i knew much about design so i'm definitely if looking back on it i would find that i had a lot of bad stuff in there but there's a lot you can do with the rules of fifth edition to like just oh, slight yeah. tweaks that really can make it and kind of kick it off uh and i see there's two questions being typed right now i think those will be the last two for tonight uh from yeah, re uh, reflected in, in c brack um uh, i have never really adapted D, D. not really um, so that brings us to the next question. Reflected yeah. tonight, Fey or dragons? Fey. Easy dragons. pick for me. Oh, really? Easy pick for me. Oh, well. I'm not as enchanted with the Fey as some. Uh, I like them, but I maybe I just don't know enough about them, right? Because like, I, I feel like my knowledge of the Fey is fairly limited. Uh, I, just, I just don't have as much exposure as some other folks. Um... C Brack uh, asks, uh, "Why would you want to? Uh, would you want a fantasy movie based in the world of D anD D, or do you feel that would take away some of the magic by giving the game an official canon of places and characters?" Um, I, I think in a lot of ways it already does kind of have an official canon with, uh, you know, in the quote unquote in the Forgotten Realms, uh, with all of the you know various books that have been uh, written by Ed Greenwood. There's like so much material for it. I would love it if it was done well if they like really put a lot of time into it and made a great one i would be ecstatic yeah i there's i don't think there's anything bad that could come of that um with very rare exception but that's a whole nother topic actually to talk about uh, yeah yeah i i don't i don't think uh there would be any issue it would not by any means ru take away any of the magic of the in my to me at least uh, Final Sheep says D&D time the animation. Okay. Uh, Reflect tonight. Who would you think would win in a D&D time legendary battle royale? Uh, and Farku deleted his comment, and why is it Fox? Uh, the answer, I think, is Bartholomew would probably win. If I had to pick. A battle royale? Yeah. Uh, I guess does Bartholomew count? Um, well, who's in it? Maybe Bartholomew's out. Are we talking like, like what's the oh, category? It's the legend characters, the four legend characters, right? Um, was well, it a party? No, no, they're legend... just all killing each other. Oh, so in the oh legendary battle royale. I see. I was thinking he was saying just like the battle royale to end all battle royales. No, no, the four. The four player characters that are in Legend here killing each other. Because it's weird, right? Because this isn't which one is the strongest character. This is which one is the most self reliant character. And I think that would have to be either Selkris or maybe Lance. Uh... It's hard to tell, right? Because Uchongus could just eat someone. I don't yeah, know, man. I, I have to. Th I'd really have to think about this a lot more. I think, but in terms I was, of, I was more interested in like the. I was feeling like the NPC standoff, barring Bartholomew. In which case, like, mm -hmm. I want to see Jangle Bones fight Clinton the Slaughter Murder. Like that'd be a great fight right there. I mean, I think Jangle Bones wins, right? It's Clinton Slaughter. I mean, he's got the chef romancy, man. They're both got. Yeah, both he's not powers. that strong. I I've always that's... imagined Clint's just yeah. not that powerful. I guess that's true. <laughs> well, he's um, like, he's not weak, but he's not like, not that strong. Um, all right, we got, I guess let's get these last three questions that are written and then we're done for reals. Farku, who, who do you have the most trouble DMing for? Uh, the answer is uh, the people I uh, know the least, whoever I know the least well. That is 
the most difficult to DM for? Uh, good answer. Uh, that's just that's just true. If you know anything about someone, you can think about that and DM for them and make a game they'll probably love, uh, uh, or at least kind of enjoy. I know a guy named. I was trying to come up with a funny name that I didn't actually know anyone with, uh, but I couldn't think of one because I just kept coming up with it. I was going to say, I have a friend named Jeff who's a real uh, dingus, but I couldn't think of anyone. Uh, I don't know. I'm with Jeremy. What D&D time character would you main in Smash? I Bartholomew, 100%. End story. Uh, we're done. Pl- player NPC? Oh, I would be a Trash King main. <laughs> Ooh. I just throw uh, you know, Maybe no. I'd play he a sounds like a No, he sounds like I'd a projectile he sounds like a projectile spam. That actually doesn't sound fun. I would play as Lord Snooty McTootington. He seems like an up, uh, uh, an up close brawler uh, who would do a lot of like you know heavy combo game maybe. Uh, last question for me uh, from uh, from C Brack. If you could only use one expansion plus the base game for the rest of your life, which would it be? Uh, I assume you mean five E. Yeah. Or was... Yeah. Okay. Um... To answer that question, I mean, I've got an answer. Um, I do too, and it's Xanathar's. It, interesting. Mine would be the player's handbook. I, th- I would not said, pick one. Uh, the base game. Yep. If I could not pick one, if I could only have one, I'd rather have none. I'd rather just have the base game. Why? Xanathar's did a lot to improve certain things. But it also juggled up the balance in a way that, like, I feel like more stuff will help iron out, like, Hexblades in that, right? Uh, yeah. Like, I don't know. I feel like there needs to be new stuff with some more invocations to help level the playing field for some of the other Warlocks in the context of the Hexblade thing. Um. Yeah, to each their own. Fair enough. That's just my, you know, personal whatever. Oh, I guess actually more than kind is Tomophos. More monsters. There we go. There we go. Easy pick. Never mind. I don't care about yeah, the gift anyway. Tomophos is good. Volo's Guide is also good. I just hate the Volo's Guide. I, I don't hate the Volo's Guide races, but I just don't Ugh. like a lot of no, I just I, don't I, like a lot of races. There are very few of them that are good. Uh, and by good, I mean even well-designed. Ugh. Um. Anyway, Anywho. that's it. That was a sad tone to end on. Just like, oh, I yeah, hate. Got to end. Got to end on the ugh. Yeah, let me just um, show. Let me just show off my awesome minis that I bought on Matty Morgs' stream, and he's gonna be streaming later, and you can buy minis there. That was not a very smooth thing. Thank you all very <laughs> much for watching D and D time talks. Uh, as always, it's a lot of fun hanging out and talking about uh talking about D stuff with you monster tactic monster tactics uh great topic um, this is a fun one yeah i hope Dude. i hope it was helpful for you guys i know yeah, it's always well. helpful for us going over this stuff uh, watch our other content pete and jeremy's D time on friday at nine eastern standard time and then also tune in to Waterdeep dragon heist uh on sunday at also 9 Eastern Standard Time or 6 o'clock Pacific, Pacific Standard Time. And for those, of you not, for those of you not in the U.S., keep in mind that everything has been f***ed up and changed around because we do weird daylight savings stuff. Daylight so savings time in mind. is a great thing. Good night, everyone. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Jeremy. I'm Pete. And this, and this is, is D&D, D&D Time, time Talks. Talks. Good night, everybody. Good night.